Welcome, great patriotic friends, to August 10th on Joe's Daily U.S. History Lesson. I am your host, Joseph DeCristoforo, and no, I am not a teacher by any means. I'm just another dude with a microphone, a laptop, and an iTunes account. I do the show because I'm a proud patriotic American. Hopefully you're listening because you are also a proud patriotic American. I do this podcast from my tool shed in my backyard in America's finest city, San Diego. By the way, if you're looking to move here, or if you have any questions on real estate investments or properties or refinancing, check out TeresaLovesRealEstate.com and then give her a call at 619-507-4906. That's 619-507-4906. Now let's begin the show as we normally do at the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's everybody stand up, face the flags if we have one, and put our right hands over our hearts and begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very nice. God bless America. And now moving on to today's headlines, I well, wish a happy birthday to Herbert Hoover. Missouri is admitted to the U.S. Another happy birthday to Charles Darrow, who came up with a Monopoly board game. And the Smithsonian is created. All right, so now let's get started. August 10th, happy birthday, Herbert the Chief Hoover. Bert, as he was known to his friends, was the first president to be born west of the Mississippi River. Born in an Iowa village in 1874, his parents both passed away when he was nine, and he grew up with an uncle in Oregon. He worked on a farm splitting logs and clearing stumps, and learned bookkeeping at his uncle's real estate business. Thanks to the help of a kind professor, he enrolled at Stanford University when it first opened up, where he met his future wife, Lou Henry, and graduating as a mining engineer. Traveling around the world using his mining degree, he found valuable mineral deposits and created business enterprises to extract the resources, making him over $4 million. He married his Stanford sweetheart, Lou Henry, and they went to China, where he worked for a private corporation as China's leading engineer. In July 1900, the Hoovers found themselves smack dab in the middle of the Boxer Rebellion in Tianjin. For several weeks, the settlement was under heavy fire. While Lou worked in the hospitals, Hoover very bravely directed protection of the building barricades. After the armistice, Hoover continued his global operations and humanitarian causes. At the outbreak of World War I, he helped 120,000 American citizens return home from Europe. After Germany took over Belgium, he supplied aid to the Belgium citizens. As World War I raged on, he extended food and supplies to famine-stricken Soviet Russia in 1921. Once a critic asked if he was therefore not helping Bolshevism, Hoover told him, quote, 20 million people are starving. Whatever their politics, they shall be fed, unquote. In 1917, President Woodrow Wilson appointed Hoover director of the Food Administration. He was loved and cherished everywhere because of his humanitarian efforts, being praised throughout Europe from citizens thanking him for their so-called Hoover lunches. After capably serving as Secretary of Commerce under Presidents Harding and Coolidge, Hoover worked to save struggling industries such as radio broadcasting and civilian aviation, and then began working on Hoover Dam, which would divide the Colorado River between Arizona and Nevada. In 1928, he became the Republican presidential nominee, saying, quote, We in America today are nearer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before in the history of any land, unquote. He destroyed Democratic Governor Alfred Smith of New York by a historic record of 444 to 87 electoral votes. These were, after all, the prosperous Roaring Twenties. And during his inauguration, he proudly stated, quote, I have no fears for the future of our country. It is bright with hope, unquote. Is it now? Within months after Hoover's election, the stock market crashed and the nation spiraled downward into the Great Depression. Unemployment rose from 3% to 23%, and millions of Americans lost everything, eventually having to live in crappy little shacks in neighborhoods known as Hooverville. Hoover responded to this by announcing that while he would keep the federal budget balanced, he would cut taxes and expand public work spending. Thanks a lot, Chief. 
The stock market crash, of course, had huge repercussions from Europe. Hoover presented a program to Congress asking for the creation of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to aid businesses, supplementary help for farmers struggling with mortgage foreclosures, banking reforms, a loan to states for aiding the millions of unemployed, and expansion of public works. Hoover was a true conservative and wanted the government to have as little control over this as possible, feeling too much involvement would undermine capitalism and individualism. While people must not suffer from hunger and cold, caring for them must be primarily a local and voluntary responsibility. During the 1930s State of the Union speech, he exclaimed, quote, Prosperity cannot be restored by raids upon the public treasury, unquote. Not quite the New Deal America would want later on. The Democrats in Congress, who he felt were sabotaging his program for their own political gain, criticized Hoover as being a callous and cruel president. Hoover was blamed for the Depression and was badly defeated in the election of 1932 to FDR, who came into presidency with the New Deal to enact programs for progressive reform and economic relief programs for all American people. In the 1930s, Hoover sharply criticized the New Deal, warning against the tendencies towards statism. Hoover returned to public office, and in 1947, President Truman appointed him to a commission, which he was elected chairman, to restructure the executive departments. His commission was extended under President Eisenhower in 1953. Many economies resulted from both commissions, recommendations, and public view of Hoover began rising up favorably again. Over the years, Hoover wrote dozens of articles and books, one of which he was working on when he quietly passed away at the ripe old age of 90 in New York City on October 20th, 1964. Happy birthday, Bert! 1821, Happy Birthday, Missouri, which, by the way, was described as Sioux Indians, as for Town of the Large Canoes. Part of the Louisiana Purchase... Missouri was admitted as a slave state as a result of the Missouri Compromise. During the Civil War, Missouri was truly on both sides of the blue and gray. Some other fun facts about Missouri. It is the home of Aunt Jemima, Mark Twain, T.S. Eliot, Tennessee Williams, and Harry Truman. Missouri is known as the Cave State due to the 6,000 caves there. We were shown great inventions at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, including cotton candy, iced tea, and Dr. Pepper. So there you have it. Happy birthday, Missouri. 1889, happy birthday, Charles Darrow. He's credited with inventing the Monopoly board game. In fact, versions of the game that went by other names had been floating around in the Midwest prior to this, but Darrow, his wife and son, designed the board game we play today, including the famous graphics for the Chance and Community chess cards, as well as the large red Go arrow and other aspects. 1846, the Smithsonian is created. James Smithson was a British scientist who wrote a very interesting clause in his will for when he died that his nephew would inherit his wealth. The weird part was the note after that stated that if his nephew died childless, then the wealth should go to, quote, the United States of America found at Washington under the name of the Smithsonian Institution, an establishment for the increase and diffusion of knowledge among men, unquote. And so it was. Nephew died childless and, turned out, Smithsonian was pretty darn rich. He left a half a million dollars in gold alone, plus his mineral collection, library, scientific notes, and more goodies. Its establishment was signed by President James Polk in 1846. These days, the Smithsonian is very informative and educational in matters of science, innovation, arts and culture, and so much more. Thanks, James. And so that, scholars, is going to wrap it up for August 10th on Joe's Daily U.S. History Lesson. Once again, I'm your host, Joseph DeCristoforo. Check out the website, joesdailyushistorylesson.com. Let me know what you thought about today's show. For example, economists. Did Herbert Hoover's domestic policies create the Great Depression or not? In my opinion, that's not necessarily a yes or no question. There's just too many moving parts to the whole system. I don't think you can put it on any one thing or one person. What do you think? Monopoly fans. Thousands of different variations for that. 
Which one's your favorite? I used to be a big fan of Dogopoly, actually. Missourians. What's your favorite part about Missouri? What's your favorite sports team? Any sport. Have you ever been to the Smithsonian? If so, what did you think? If not, why not? So yeah, let me know for sure. And be sure to check out tomorrow's program. I'll talk about the brake beat, the automatic sprinkler system, Ronald Reagan, the pull chain for lights, and the Green Bay Packers. So don't miss that. In the meantime, you can catch me on Facebook and Twitter. My Twitter handle is JDUSHL. And until then, thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for being great patriotic Americans. We'll see you then.